Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Economic Inclusion's Reckoning to Rise Together series. This is our last event of 2022, and I am Tawana Black, the founder and CEO of the Center, and I am thrilled to be able to welcome you to this event. We are excited that so many of you have joined us throughout 2021. What an exciting time we've had. What an awesome and amazing time we've had reckoning together to build wealth equity throughout not only Minnesota, but across the country. Over 8,000 people have reckoned with us in one way or another here live for these sessions of Reckoning to Rise Together, joining us in Facebook and YouTube series online, inviting us to join in in your own organizations, in your businesses, in your agencies, in your homes as you've watched this over and over and then reached out to us in order to gain other opportunities in order to join and take deeper actions inside your organizations that can begin to train transform our economies and build a more racially equitable and inclusive economy. We are not done yet. We have much more work to do in order to close racial wealth gaps, but the work begins by us listening to one another, hearing the experiences of Black people who are moving and shaking, taking actions to close racial wealth gaps themselves, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. Next slide, please. We have a deeper opportunity in our communities to be sure that we are communicating not only here in this space, but also online. And we want to be sure that as you listen to our speakers today and every day, that you make sure that you are also sharing this conversation in Facebook and on Twitter, on LinkedIn and on Instagram. So take note of that hashtag, reckoning the number two and rise, and that you're tagging the conversation that you're tagging our speakers and myself, you're tagging the economic inclusion, econ, and the, then the word inclusion on those platforms, and of course, your own organizations, and letting us know exactly what you're doing, what you're being moved by as our speakers and I have a conversation today in order to keep that conversation moving. Next slide, please. We wanna be sure too that you take advantage of lunch. Lunch from our business owners across our community in our black, indigenous, Latinx and Asian communities who are making sure that our economy grows by having workers in our communities and offering things to you that you can take advantage of for lunch. So if you go to our website, you'll see links to these businesses and we encourage you as we do every month in our Reckoning series to buy lunch from one of these vendors because if we don't buy from them, not only once a month, but all the time, if you don't cater from them, We'll be saying goodbye to many great businesses in our economy and goodbye to the many jobs that they create in our economy as well. I wanna take the time before we jump in to thank our sponsors. So many businesses are doing great work. Foundations are investing in our organization and in these businesses. And we wanna say thank you to them. We wanna say a big thank you to the Kauffman Foundation who is partnering with the Center for Economic Inclusion to close racial wealth gaps by investing in entrepreneurs, by investing in ensuring that these businesses continue to grow and prosper and create jobs in our economy. We want to thank Allianz and Best Buy, the Bush Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, and Varde, who have partnered with us continually inside our business and inside the Center for Economic Inclusion and our region and helping us bring this series to you and bring our other events to you. And we wanna thank 3M, CH Robinson, Comcast and Wertenson for their continued partnership with us and investment in the Center for Economic Inclusion. This is an opportunity we want to also take advantage of to do a little bit of polling to find out who's in the room. So if you're ready right now, we wanna have our poll go ahead and come up now on your screens to find out a little bit about you. You should see a poll on your screens right now that gives us a chance to find out who's here from both a demographic perspective. We're asking you questions about who you are, your racial background, your age, but um, uh, 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 if I could talk right now, what generation you're from, what your gender identity is, and how many events of ours that you've participated in, more recently in particular, and we'll ask you what you've done with the knowledge and insights that you've gained since participating in these events. We ask these questions both because, as you know, we're committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and specifically racial equity and inclusion and belonging. We're also committed to ensuring that as we bring you together, you're participating in these events, 
and these workshops in order to gain knowledge and relationships, skills and tools from our speakers in the center that you go out and use inside your own organizations, that you meet people in the chat and in this room, and then start to catalyze new relationships and networks that help you take actions inside your own organizations, actions that begin to transform our economy. So we'd like to ask you a few of these questions and we'll continue polling with follow-up surveys that help us determine how well we're achieving these goals. And we'll ask you for additional input through the survey at the end of today's session to help us know how well we're achieving these goals and what you'd like to see in our 2022 workshops and programming in order to achieve these goals and the goals that you have inside your own organization. You can see some of the results right now. We have a diverse room as always, and we'll continue to diversify that even more. It's great to know as always, we have a lot of first timers here. So welcome to our first timers, more than 50% of you. This is your first event. We love that and love having you. And great to see 13% of you that have been to more than six of the center's events. And great to see that a lot of you are using what you're gaining at these events and workshops. 59% have developed new relationships as a result of being in these sessions, reckoning to rise together. 26% have developed a new workforce policy, practice or strategy. A lot of focus on talent in our region is causing us to reckon to rise together. 15% are focused on supplier diversity as a result of what you've learned in these sessions. And we hope that today's session pushes that number up even higher as we listen to business owners in our community who give you great opportunities to invest in their businesses and take action in your supply chain. 9% focused on philanthropy practices, policies, and investments. 11% are focused on growing and diversifying their marketplace strategies and opportunities. And a higher number are taking action in economic development workforce development, policy practices, and strategies. Great options and opportunities for us to continue to move forward in our communities. And we love seeing that you're continuing to take actions to move us forward. We are excited to get into today's opportunities, to get into today's um, conversation as a result of these great panelists and partners in the community who have come forward today to join us. I'm excited to introduce now into the conversation uh, somebody who doesn't really need an introduction at all that many of you have come to know, certainly, and I hope who you've watched a series um, and been able to meet. At this time, I'll invite Amanda Brinkman, who is nationally renowned brand expert, public speaker, and Forbes contributor. At Deluxe, Amanda is the chief brand officer and creator, producer, and host of the Emmy-nominated hit series, Small Business Revolution. On the show, Amanda showcases her love for small businesses by spearheading efforts to revitalize entire communities and providing makeovers to small businesses across America. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. This is so fun. Thank you. Absolutely. We were able to meet um, now, I think more than a year ago, um, with this idea um, uh, that you had to be able to bring the show back into Minneapolis and St. Paul, and in particular, I, um, I think I was most excited to be able to um, hear your passion um, and investment in small businesses, but more than that, a passion in small businesses for this community um, and to see the opportunity to be able to lift up uh, black owned businesses in this community. Can you tell me um, really what inspired you uh, to do that, to come back and have a focus here in Minneapolis, St. Paul and specifically on black owned businesses in this community? Yes, well, thank you for the opportunity to, to share the story. So uh, as you mentioned, the Small Business Revolution uh, has been a show, an original unscripted series. It's kind of a small business makeover show um, where each episode we work with a different small business and we share their story. Um, we walk alongside them with resources like marketing and finances and operations. And the spirit of the program has always been really positive. It's always been really about not like traditional reality shows where you try to make people look silly, but really just walking alongside. And the whole reason that we share the stories of the small businesses is because we want to really create a movement. We want more people to understand the importance of supporting small businesses. And when you hear a small business owner's story, you know, it, it makes you want to go and support them. It makes you recognize that you're, it, you're not just making a purchase. 
uh, you're supporting a person and their dream and their family and the community that they reside in. And so for the first five seasons of the show, it was always in a different small town and we had a whole voting process and everything. And we've seen what an impact it's made when you invest in small businesses in that entire town and in that entire community, that when you have strong small businesses, entire communities can thrive. And so we've, we've seen kind of the proof of the program. And so, uh, gosh, it's been uh, way back in, in May now of 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, I think everyone's eyes were open to how much racial injustice is still prevalent within our society. I think every brand and every company and everyone, and hopefully individually was trying to figure out how to be a, a um, part of the way forward and part of positive momentum, not just healing in Minneapolis, but doing what we can to break down some of those systemic barriers that still exist. And for us, we've seen what a difference this program has made in terms of building up small businesses. And then again, that ripple effect within the community. And so for us, this just felt like a natural way to be a part of the solution. So could we show what a difference it makes in terms of a way forward to really invest in the small businesses within Minneapolis and St. Paul? And in previous seasons, it's always been kind of one main street within that small town, but could we pick you know, six neighborhoods across the Twin Cities that are really vital to our, our cultural identity and, and to our community. And so for us, this was just our way that we could participate. There's so many things we need to address as a society around racial injustice, but one of the ways forward is around economic empowerment and showing what a difference it makes when you intentionally support black owned businesses, when you intentionally invest in them with the resources that perhaps weren't always available. And, uh, and so, yeah, this is just a, a way for us to be a part of, of the solution here locally. I love a couple of things that you lifted up there, one being the vital importance of these communities. And so often the communities that you invested in are given labels, but it's rare that the label that we're given is vital, vital to economics, vital to the cities that we're in. And so thank you for lifting up that asset and that label that is one of an asset. The other is the word support, often in communities like ours, the word support can have a, a double-edged sword. And so thank you also for uh, giving that word specifically again in black communities and black business corridors and commercial corridors um, and bringing life to the fact that there are more than one commercial corridor where black businesses are thriving and yet continue to need the support and investment and spending and dollars from consumers, from corporations, continuing to give that another lens and another story. Can you talk to us about what the experience was like? And really even I think from, from A to Z, if you will, and even today, because I know the experience continues to play out once the show goes live, if you will, what was that experience like? And, and if it was different from other um, series um, that you've produced, tell us what that was like. Well, you're not, we aren't supposed to have a favorite season and we're never supposed to pick a favorite business, right? Because we love them all. But there was something really magical about this season. So you mentioned that you and I, you know, uh, started chatting over a year ago. So even though the spirit of the program has always been really positive, we started this season's planning with a, a lot of community listening. We just really wanted to make sure we were getting this work right, that the tonality of it uh, was honoring to the Black community, that we were certainly... Um, uh, that we were doing something that was truly helpful and would have sustaining change. You know, I think, again, a lot of companies were kind of rushing to almost this hashtag activism. And we wanted to really be doing something that uh, remained after the outrage subsided. And that was still, you know, participating even, even after that, that initial um, uh, kind of outrage. And so for us, what we really loved about this season is we were able to bake in the story of the neighborhood into each of the episodes. So in typical seasons, episode one was about the town and then each of the episodes was out of, about a business. This year we were able to share the story of that community in which the small business resided and the history and, and tell the truth about what had happened in the past, but also in a very positive way forward. So uh, for example, I saw one of the logos we had for lunch was Taste of Rondo in the Rondo neighborhood. So in that episode, we talk about the history of Rondo and what happened there. And it's, I think what I was shocked by was how many people who live in the Twin Cities don't even understand the history of what has happened within our own community. And so we also wanted to bake in some of those lessons too, um, really talking about some of, you know, I think within the white community, there's still a lot of lack of understanding when people were talking about racial injustice. If it's not your reality and you haven't experienced it, I think people were still like, well, I don't understand how this is still 
uh, uh, how, how is this still prevalent in our business world and in our communities? And so we wanted to bake in some of those history and some of those statistics. You uh, provided so many incredible insights in your interview on the show. And we had a number of community leaders that came forward and, and shared some of those statistics to kind of bake in some of that education, almost a Trojan horse of a sort. So as you're watching these episodes, you learn more than just the business owner's story and even more than just the neighborhood, but you learn about uh, some of that history and what it's going to take to move forward around um, changing some of these realities and leveling the playing field. And the fact that if we've been disproportionately investing in uh, marginalized communities and in their businesses, that the investment now needs to be disproportionate in the other way. We really do need to focus on investment that isn't just at parity, but it is making up for that gap. Otherwise that, well, you know, this is what you talk about all the time, but that gap is just going to stay the same. So I don't think that answered your question, but this season was just really special. And I, what I was really, really so proud of, I'm from the Twin Cities and I've always been proud of the Twin Cities, but every conversation I would have with a different community leader would lead to another one and to another one. And everybody was, was willing to help inform this work, understood the, the positive and, and ultra or just authentic uh, intentions behind it. And I was just really moved by how many people like your organization, like you and your team are already doing this really important work of supporting entrepreneurs within the Twin Cities. And so for us, it wasn't about thinking that our show coming to town was going to make some sort of seismic change, but to highlight all of these incredible organizations across the Twin Cities that are already, again, investing in entrepreneurs and providing those resources. I absolutely love um, uh, so many things and threads there. Um, uh, the, the intentionality, the importance of investing, um, again, not just at parity, but to um, over-index on that investing for folks who might be attending. I know there are folks who said uh, so many who are here for their very first time, but who say, you know, wait a minute, what does that mean exactly to say that because of history, because of so much disinvestment, because of so much pulling wealth out of our communities in order to get to equity, we have to over-index on the amount of investment um, that goes into businesses. And I want to give you an opportunity so that folks get a sense of what we're talking about here if we haven't seen um, an episode to tee um, a little bit up here. For five years, Deluxe and Small Business Revolution have traveled from one small town Main Street to the next. This is small town America. Top of the morning to you! Congratulations! Welcome to the revolution! Bringing expertise, resources, and thousands of hours of work into helping small businesses thrive. Thank you, bottom of my heart. And building a movement that is millions strong. But 2020 changed everything. Business was good, and then the pandemic hit. I wasn't bringing a paycheck home for almost a year. This sustains our family. And no one was hit harder than Black-owned businesses in Minneapolis and St. Paul. You would think after 86 years, their stories wouldn't have the same headline, but they do. It was time for the small business revolution to come home. Amanda Brinkman and her new co-host, entrepreneur and NBA all-star Baron Davis. I'm not gonna try nothing on, but uh... I don't judge. Are joining forces with a whole team of community leaders, influencers, icons, and marketing experts. This is the work that we have to do. Absolutely. Right. right now, you're not getting paid to run the business. Getting behind six incredible Black-owned businesses from across our hometown. It's the evolution of legacy, right? To see if together, in a moment unlike anything we've ever seen, we can keep the revolution alive. The deluxe team got it. Now we're talking. Yeah. Oh man! <laughs> now streaming on Hulu, Prime Video, and SmallBusinessRevolution.org. So very wonderful, so very amazing. I, I see our chat going um, uh, really just wild and, and you can see how many fans you have of the show and it's something to have people who love the show. It's something else to have people who um, uh, really feel the pride of their communities being represented and their stories told. And I have to say the personal side of this for me isn't just the work um, done now and it's hard not to be um, 
emotional uh, uh, when watching this story come to life. Um, uh, as I, uh, as you know, led Northside Funders Group for five years. Um, and through that work, we produced this, a series some years ago called Northside Storyville intentionally to give us a much smaller platform, of course, than um, Small Business Revolution, but to the stories in community and heard at that time, just how much it meant to uh, everyday folks who are doing everyday work, living their lives, trying to um, uh, produce a business or um, uh, uh, just live and how rare it is that our stories are told. And so while I um, uh, do this all the time, um, I have to say, Amanda, um, and this is unscripted, just um, another thank you um, because it's rare that the stories are told um, uh, in genuine voice. Um, uh, about so much importance, but where the real heart of community is not stripped away. Um, uh, so thank you um, for doing this and doing it right. Um, thank you for doing this and doing it right. Um, thank you for doing this and doing it right. And with that, I want to um, welcome into the conversation another voice um, who is doing work and doing it well and doing it right. Shauna Hughes is going to join us now. Um, and Shauna is the global product Growth and Innovation Evangelist at Get Feedback, the leading customer experience management solution for Salesforce. She's also a leader at Momentum, an artificial intelligence powered platform that offers enterprise solutions for decision makers who are shaping the future. Shauna's leadership to help underrepresented youth and adults break into technology, such as Teen Tech Titans, Pep Up Tech, and WIT Diversity, has led to multiple awards, including Equality Trailblazer Award and the Golden Hoodie from Salesforce. And I'm thrilled that she's able to join us today. Welcome into the conversation. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, Tamika. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Well, I'm sorry, Tawana. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking I'm talking to Tamika because you know Tamika's the star of the show today. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm thrilled that she's here too and is going to join us in just a little bit here. I want to ask you a question as you join us in here. Um, tell us about as you consider the businesses we're going to talk about today. What do corporations need to know and be thinking about as it relates to Black-owned businesses and the landscape um, for Black-owned businesses? We have Amanda, who's here, um, who's got the dual worlds of a company like Deluxe and then the world of Small Business Revolution. We know that we're in a community that is full of large um, global and, and national corporations and a lot of reckoning happening here. What do you believe businesses need to be thinking about as they watch a show and, and know that businesses are made up of people who go to work every day and just do work. What do they need to be thinking about as it relates to black owned businesses as they watch a show like this? Yeah, I, you know, nowhere is structural racism more apparent than in corporate America. Um, and one of the things that I really, um, you know, speak to businesses on and how they should invest in communities um, is really, you know, number one with their pocketbooks, of course, and number two, with asking the community. You know, Deluxe did something amazing where they went into the communities and they didn't push their own agenda. They didn't have their own narrative that they wanted to, you know, tell. They asked the community, what story did they want to tell? And they told that story authentically. Um, and that's what a lot of organizations need to be able to do is to be able to ask us, you know, the people who live and work and uh, just enjoy these communities, how can we help you? Um, and, and that's something that has yet to be done in a way that is going to uplift, uh, you know, the Black community and the, and the Black business community overall. How does that resonate to you, Amanda? Uh, very much so. I mean, I think, again, I, I referenced the community listing earlier, but I think, I mean, it wasn't that we were just, community listening sometimes can be a loaded phrase because sometimes companies will say like, we're going to do listening. And then like, but are they actually listening? Are they actually like informing it? And like literally every conversation I had did truly shape and inform this work. Um, and I could name different conversations I've had and why different parts of the program became what they were because of it. Um, but the list would be long and, and I don't want to take up too much time. But I think it's about not just doing the listening to check some sort of DEI initiative box, but to truly want to hear what is being said and then help that inform 
the work. And, and I think the other piece too, is we were always really careful not to say we were going to be telling the stories of small businesses within Minnesota, but sharing the stories and, and allowing for those stories to come through from the business owners, from the community, that it wasn't about a company taking ownership of someone else's story, but just using a platform that we have in order to, to lift that up. And I think every company has an opportunity to do that. They, every company has some sort of position um, platform, giant megaphone they're standing behind. And if you're not using that to stand for something or to not use it to stand for actual change, then, then what are we doing as people on this planet? It can't just be to make money. It has to be somehow to influence positive change and, and making the whole world a better place. And so anyway, I'll get off my soapbox, but I think it's about not just saying you're doing listening to check a box. It's about actually hearing when you're doing right. Taking action as the, you know, is the one thing and you know Amanda you, you know our friend Christina Jones uh that works at Salesforce one of the things that she coined for me was action leadership and that's something that you you know just really really exemplify and and I think that a lot of people you know need to take a page from your book and 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 not just talk about it but be about it you know and if you think about structural racism and access to capital only 70% of African-American communities have, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I'm saying this backwards. 70% of African-American communities don't have a branch bank of any type in their communities. So black businesses are overwhelmingly requesting access to funding and things of that nature. And they're not getting, they're not getting it. <laughs> um, so when you think about that, you think about the impact that you know, organizations that operate in our communities aren't investing in our communities in ways that are beneficial to our communities. Um, it, it it makes me it makes me angry, right? It's like you're you're taking from our communities. The black dollar is powerful. The black culture is powerful. Um, we drive so much of the trends that get set, we drive so much of it, and yet we aren't benefiting from it in the way that we should, and we haven't been allowed to. Absolutely, and a huge powerful piece that connects to our last reckoning series um, was about the advertising industry and the need to be investing in black owned media in order to reach black consumers, in order to reach black owned businesses and that um, uh, reciprocal uh, relationship, but one that really shows a value in black people um, by showing a value in black owned businesses. Um, uh, Shawna, you work on platforms every day. I appreciate Amanda noting that importance of the platform. If corporations are out there saying right now, okay, where do we start if we wanna build a platform that then starts to connect to black owned businesses what do you recommend yeah if if they're looking to build a platform um and if you're talking about technology uh then you know no one tech stack is you know i i, I would say the end all be all that's going to solve all your problems However, I would say look at organizations that are giving back to the communities that have a diverse workforce um, that are investing in your communities. And there are organizations who do that and who do that authentically. Um, so do your research when you're buying from these companies, which we all have to, we all have to purchase software, we all have to purchase hardware, um, but do your research, do your due diligence to say, is this company someone that I wanna give my hard earned dollars to and invest in that way? And then if you need someone to help you um, really you know, structure and set up your systems and services, look at minority and black owned businesses. Absolutely. Totally appreciate that. I want to say thank you to both of the two of you for joining us for this portion of it. We're going to join in now with the businesses who were engaged in this series, and we're going to come back to these two in our Q&A session. So I want to encourage our audience to be thinking about questions that you want to ask them and teeing those up into our platform, um, to the point of platform, so that you can be asking those questions um, in the chat and in the uh, Zoom platform. At this point, I want to introduce our panelists who are 
business owners who are featured in the Small Business Revolution. I want to introduce now Rick Harris, Tamika Jones, and Sammy McDowell. Rick Harris is the president of Ideal Commercial Interiors. After more than 30 years of doing business in the furniture markets, Rick launched the business in 2012 in Minnesota, focusing on commercial interior design and commercial furniture services for mid-sized companies and major corporations in the private sector. Ideal Commercial Interiors holds contracts with Hennepin County, the University of Minnesota, the City of St. Paul, Target Corp, and is performing as a subcontractor for major construction companies in the Twin Cities metro area. Welcome, Rick. Tamika Jones is the founder and CEO of Lip Esteem, right here. With over 20 years of experience as a makeup artist, in July 2020, Tamika launched Lip Esteem, a complete line of plant-based lipstick to complement all skin tones. To mark the company's one-year anniversary, Lip Esteem moved into a permanent office space in St. Paul, offering larger space for retail sales, consultations, private parties, and fulfillment of online orders. The company is now poised to partner with additional retailers, including salons, boutiques, and cooperatives looking for plant-based, gluten-free, and cruelty-free product lines. And Sammy McDowell is the founder, owner, and operator of Sammy's Avenue Eatery, located on Broadway Avenue in Minneapolis. After 23 years in the food and hospitality business, Sammy launched Sammy's in 2012 using his personal savings and inspiration from his grandmother. The restaurant is wildly popular and a community hub, so much so that he is adding a second location in North Minneapolis, a food truck, and soon to be open food hall. Welcome to each one of you. I'm thrilled to have you here joining on today. And I'm so excited for not only the investment that each one of you are making in our communities, but the investment that our community is making in each one of your businesses and the partnership with Small Business Revolution. I wanna start with a question for each one of you. The story is told a bit in the bios, but each one of you will tell it even more yourselves. What motivated you to go into business yourself? Sammy, would you like to start? Sure, why not? Um, well, after working for, um, you know, corporate restaurant, they've been in the restaurant business for so long, um, I really decided to um, start because I wanted to represent people that look like me. Um, I was kind of tired of being the only one um, of color and rooms filled with people who are not of color, you know, receiving awards and doing all this stuff. But I was like, where, where are my people at? So I wanted to be more in our community to represent us and to represent um, what's possible in our community. So that was one of the um, drives for me is to um, excel in our community, but to do it um, for the young people that look like me to have something to look to or to aspire to be, et cetera, et cetera. You've done just that. Thank you. Thank you. Tamika. Um, the reason, hi, thank you for having me today, first of all. Uh, the reason why I started on my journey of entrepreneurship the way that I did and the timing that I did is, um, out of kind of out of fear, out of aggravation, out of uh, the trauma that I was going through, that many of us were going through uh, during the civil unrest and the murder of George Floyd. I actually had a Facebook page that was uh, specifically for business people. And on that page, I daily would see so many things that were so negative against my community. And these were people that I knew, people that I worked with. And I just decided enough is enough. It's time for me to take you know, my life and my mental health into my own hands and start my business. Excellent, and Rick. Uh, good morning, thanks for uh, having me on as well. Um, I started my business after working uh, in a corporation where I saw uh, many um, young African-American men get turned away from uh, the business I was working in just because they didn't look right or didn't uh, come with the right attitude and those things. And so it was a lack of understanding for some of the young men who would show up. And I really remember standing out one day and seeing one young man walk away with his head 
um, hung down because he didn't get the job and, and kind of said to myself, I wanted to be able to create opportunities for our community and to be able to um, work with young people and help them prepare for the future in their life and make a, a better life. So that was really um, the beginning of my trek with starting my business. I love the through line. Thank you for that, Rick. And I love the through line for each one of you that is not only the story and the personal inspiration for yourselves, but that each one of you, um, while every business owner, I think, inspires other people and leaves a trail for other people, but that each one of you had intentionality about leaving that trail for other people. And I certainly um, doing that. Each one of you um, are, are folks that I look to um, uh, as a business owner and leader myself. And so I, I love that that's been intentional for each one of you. Can you talk to us as Black business owners, um, as employers, um, as, or employing other people about how you are navigating something that is widely proclaimed for entrepreneurs, for business owners, the challenges that employers face with talent. Um, this is something that is talked about often for large corporations and often um, is talked about about Black talent. And so I'd like having a platform here today for Black business owners and employers. What are you facing in this market right now as it relates to um, attracting talent, keeping talent, um, and navigating those turns as you seek to grow your businesses, um, in particular in a pandemic? I can say for me, um, Lipisteam is 16 months old now, I think. And uh, in August, I just had my first employee, full-time employee. And so I, this is a gradual scaling, um, and, but the employee is my daughter. So the benefit that I have for it being my daughter is that she knows me. She knows my expectations. She knows how I want you, her to uh, deal with customers, the love I want and the care that I want to give. But now we're still scaling. So in my mind, the person kind of has to know me and my heart for community and for customers. So I'm not sure yet but my eye is always open as I go to pop-ups and I meet different people to see who has that personality that can love on everybody, even when they're having a bad day. Like who, so, so for me, I'm always looking farmer's markets. I'm looking when I go to stores, I'm always searching because I have heard that it's challenging to find employees, but at this time, um, I haven't had to deal with that. And my daughter, she's staying full time. So she's not going anywhere, mm. right? <laughs> I, I would like to say, I kind of like growing um, employees and uh, same, same similar, uh, meeting people where they are and helping them to reach their dreams and goals. I think we have a lot of um, young people in our um, communities who are working in places where they just uh, you talk about glass ceiling, it's really an iron ceiling where not only can they not see, uh, but they can't break through. So I think creating opportunities and talking with people to say, hey, I'm going to help you get to where I am. And I've always told anyone who works for me, if you can do my job, uh, you can have it as president. I'll run and do something else. I always can find something else to do. So really giving them an opportunity and having them have a dream to say, you know, I can do it. And with my help, and um, getting them there, we've uh, been able to employ uh, six people to date, uh, two of them of which uh, my kids, my son and my daughter just joined me, um, who's handling my finances. And so I was able to bring them on into business. So that's um, a, a real win for me. And as we continue to grow, I look forward to hiring other people who have a passion about the furniture industry that can continue what I've started. What about you, Sammy? I definitely would say um, as um, we've been around, we're, we're about to be 10 years old um, in January. So it's, it's taken a while to um, really get the um, right fits, if you will. It takes time to really um, put the puzzles together. Um, but as um, I'm a person of faith, so prayerfully, I've been um, really... Um, 
um, just um, going after, I would say, more mothers, um, moms who are uh, working together, organizing. Our uh, shop right now is ran by moms. They have families, they have children, but they work together to make sure that things are together and things are getting done and um, really paying attention to um, especially um, our Black women, um, they get the job done. And um, so they have really encouraged me to really pour more into um, them, uh, the ability to run a family, run a home, run a business. You know, they're like running rings around me. So it's like, um, I'm loving it. And um, to really um, encourage like families to kind of work together is kind of what in the future, we want to move the model to as, you know, families owning these franchises and et cetera, et cetera, because they're, it just seems to be working right now. So um, even during the pandemic, you know, they stuck together, um, communication was well. And so it's like, we're finding our niche in um, moms and families right now. So that's, I think that's where, where I'm at right now. I absolutely love that. You got me ready to jump out of my chair. Um, I, I love the family um, a business model uh, here. I'm, I'm raising an eight and a 10 year old and uh, my daughter tells everybody that she works for mom's businesses um, uh, and she's going to forever. Um, so I love what we, both you, Tamika and Rick shared um, and Sam made that investment in um, uh, black women. And in particular at a time like this where many um, women have, uh, whether uh, by force or by choice, have may have children um, still at home, may not be able to send children to a child care facility or to a school, or, or as we know, schools are still shutting down, um, and so may need to balance responsibilities in ways that are not the way they looked two years ago. And so to have an employer who says, I see it as an asset that mothers are figuring out how to balance the family and the business, I applaud you um, uh, for being able to vocalize that as an asset um, and speaks to um, other employers about how to think about things perhaps a bit non-traditionally and not the way that we have before, but how that speaks to yet another job credential. I want to ask you all um, in your businesses, each one of you are different. We picked um, uh, the three of you because you offer something very different to the marketplace um, and yet your businesses um, uh, and the way you lead your businesses and your stage of growth is unique as well um, uh, on the Small Business Revolution series. What role does corporate um, contracting, supplier diversity um, play in your businesses? Um, and then talk to us maybe in contrast to that um, about what role and what actions you think con corporations need to take, whether that is their contracting with black owned businesses, their investing in growing black owned businesses, um, philanthropy and support of black owned businesses in order to see racial equity and wealth building begin to take place in new ways. Uh, I can start. Um, I think that um, the onus is on us as black businesses to help other black businesses. Um, so many times we can get caught up with just looking at what we need and what we're doing. Uh, a few years ago, a friend of mine and another group of um, uh, small businesses who were in the goods and services arena started an organization called Minnesota Minority Goods and Services. And um, our uh, goal is to, you know, really to advocate for, and uh, we call it the ABCs, pretty much advocate, build, and collaborate with other businesses. We know that we're small businesses, but working together, we can do a lot. And not only sharing uh, resources, sharing employees, sharing finances. So I think that uh, our way out of this thing is working together and not trying to do it apart. But uh, to answer your question, I think that uh, the opportunity that are there, I'm encouraged by some of the things that are happening in our community uh, with uh, some of the agencies really starting to get it. I've been in this thing going on for 10 years now, it'll be 10 years next year for myself as well. And from the time I started to now, I do see change happening. So I'm encouraged that companies are starting to get it, you know, looking at from Target with their uh, goals of spending um, $2 billion over the next four years and looking at what NDC uh, and Meta and uh, some of the other Hennepin County and City of St. Paul are doing in their equity departments. I'm encouraged by some of the changes I see and I think we need to get behind and help one another. Thanks for that, Rick. Speaker, Sammy. 
Can you um, restate the question? I'm so sorry. Sure. Sure. What role do you think that corporate, whether it's corporate supplier diversity, um, corporate contributions, corporate support, what role do you think that plays either in your business today or in the business of helping black owned businesses expand and grow uh, more quickly in our communities to close racial wealth gaps? I honestly think that um, I don't see it as much, but I think that that is a great um, vehicle that could happen if it uh, happened more often. Um, because um, just like our church adopted a high school and we're partnering with them and we're coaching the kids, et cetera, um, I just feel like um, bigger companies, big corporate companies could do the same, adopt small businesses, et cetera, uh, to help them, support them, and to um, help them grow in whatever aspect, um, align them with, uh, I've always thought that was a good model to use, but I don't see it being done or, you know, as much, but, um, you know, cause I'm so busy working. I sometimes don't, I, I may not see it, but I do applaud the targets and all those places that do help small minority businesses get their products in stores and all those kind of things. So, but I think a lot more can be done. And for me, I think that corporations should take on the strategy that Deluxe and the Small Business Revolution took on, and that is to look at us uh, Black businesses as an opportunity, not as being needy. You know, they saw us and they said, ooh, you know, they, these businesses don't need us, but it's an opportunity for us to collaborate and for us to be able to help them and then them in turn help us. Because I'm sure there's a whole new demographic of small business revolution watchers because of who they had on this season. So corporations and banks need to stop looking at black businesses as needy businesses, but we are thriving. We are doing well within our own communities. And if they take the chance and like providing us with economic support, then we can go to higher levels, which would take them to higher levels. Look, they need to look at us differently than how we've been looked at. So, a whole new world. Whole new world, absolutely. I appreciate each one of those answers. Uh, the unity that Rick talked about um, inside the minor, my Minnesota Minority Goods and Services um, uh, Network, as well as um, your points, both Sammy and Tamika. Um, and to me, I'll underscore your point in terms of when it, what happens when businesses, corporations start to look at investing, spending with supporting black owned businesses differently from how do we go help um, to how do we invest in ways that are good for everyone and ultimately good for the economy and starting to see things like um, a small business revolution and deluxe um, recognizing that by featuring uh, black owned businesses um, and investing in businesses, you're gonna invest in some anyway um, uh, that you draw in new consumers, you draw in new viewers, which draws in um, uh, new advertisers who want to reach one of the largest consumer groups in the country, um, uh, which then helps the show continue to grow with it. It's good for business all the way around, um, uh, which is a little bit different than traditional supplier diversity um, approaches have been, which tend to be in a, a pretty small segment. Um, I want to um, lift up something that I saw, Tamika, a couple of days ago, a post that you had on LinkedIn, and I hope you'll appreciate um, and be okay with me lifting this up because I think it tends to cross our entire portfolio, which was the notion of capital. Um, every small business just about uh, needs capital at some point, whether it is to get started or it's to grow into a new business line, perhaps. Um, maybe it's about adding more employees, but the amount of capital that's needed in order to make it um, and continue to scroll, grow and scale to add employees. And I appreciated the um, authenticity in your post to say, hey, like I know some things, but I need to know where are folks finding capital? Um, is it through loans? Is it through investments? Is it through friends and family? Is it through grants? Like where are these sources? And I've been in this business long enough to know that it's not always just taking a class because you can take it. Once you get in business, you still are looking for what are those sources of capital? And can you all talk to us about for those organizations, those businesses who are watching today, and might say, okay, you receive support from Small Business Revolution, but among your own yourselves and other business owners, you know, 
what sorts of capital and support are most helpful to business owners in a climate like this? I can just say, for, let me just say about that post. I posted it and I actually took it down because I, I didn't know how the tone of it was, but I meant what I said, like I'm scaling. I keep going into these spaces where people are talking about or listening to black voices, but I don't, no one's knocking at my door saying here, let me help you. And so my scaling can only go so far with what I have. I've been bootstrapping this whole time. So everything I have goes back in, right? But there's no line of credit. There's no loans out there that people are investing in me. And so because that was the first time I posted like that, I was like, if nobody likes this, I got to take this down because I don't want to sound like uh, an angry person that's looking for monies. But at this point, I'm not angry, but I am looking for monies because I am growing, but I can only do so much with so little. So it's very important that we have these conversations, but it's also extremely important that the people that are in these seats and that are listening to us are actually helping and not just being a listening ear because that's not helping us. You got to, you got to put your money where your mouth is, please. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I want you to know, sis, um, uh, there, nothing angry came ap across in the post, but I know how rare it is that entrepreneurs feel comfortable lifting it up, which is why I wanted to lift it up in this space where everyone who's in this room should yeah. be in this room because they want to see Black businesses grow and scale and businesses not grow and scale without money. Thank you. Truth. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I will, I'll answer the question I posed myself, um, y'all, those of you who are here, um, we have a lot of, of, of partners who are in banking, we have partners who are in intermediaries. Um, what I'll lift up for you all is often we all think, well, there's loans available. Uh, most of those loans are too high interest to make them available for businesses who are less than five years and even less than 10 years old to truly go out and begin to scale their businesses. Even the loans that are available through our intermediaries, NDC um, and, and Mita, and I've spent time, I'm at, particularly here recently with Renee Dossman, we're working on strategies focused on Black women-owned businesses and Latina women-owned businesses have said, actually, Actually, most of the applicants are not able to secure those investments. We need different tools. We need forgivable loans available yeah. for our businesses. We need revenue-based investments available for our businesses. We need equity investments available that don't take so much of the business away that it's no longer a Black-owned business. So we need folks who are here today to be thinking about how do we get new investment tools out that can really get to scale in these innovative businesses that help those large corporations who are in our marketplace really meet those goals that have been declared and meet them by investing in Minnesota-based Black-owned businesses so they're not having to flow outside our state where some of these businesses already exist at scale. So we encourage everybody who's here with us today to think about and help partner with us to drive those investments. I want to okay, absolutely, absolutely. I want to ask another question. I want to encourage our awesome, our awesome audience to be thinking about their questions and, and getting ready to drop those in the chat because we're going to open it up to you all in just a moment. So you three participated in different ways in the Small Business Revolution series. I want to talk to you about what that experience was like, and I want to just really open up the floor for you about what the experience was like from the moment that you got the call or the email that Amanda was going to go down this pathway of investing in Black-owned businesses in Minneapolis, St. Paul, clear to today. Who'd like to begin? I would like to say, <clears throat> first, it was very surreal. Um, I honestly woke up, I think, halfway through the shooting, even when we had our initial talks with Amanda and the deluxe team, I was still in shock, like, you know, that someone was really interested in profiling North Minneapolis and the small Black business in North Minneapolis and all that. Um, we contribute to our community. Um, it was just an um, overwhelming feeling. So I think I kind of uh, just walk through the first half of the series, like not even, you know, just uh, 
astounded. And I was just like thankful that we were able to um, highlight all the important things that go on in North Minneapolis and that uh, the trailblazers and the folks who are really there every day, putting in the hard work to do what needs to be done to um, sustain our community and to grow our community. So, and all those people who are, especially yeah, the entrepreneurs who are investing themselves into um, you know, the fabric of our communities. I, I was just um, really amazed that somebody would want to tell our story on such a um, large scale. So I just think it was a great opportunity and I'm definitely grateful for it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll just say my experience, just like Sammy's, I couldn't believe it. First of all, during the application process, as I read it, I had nothing that they were looking for. I didn't have a storefront. I didn't have, uh, I didn't live in the community or my storefront, which I didn't have, wasn't in one of the communities. And so something just kept saying, keep going, because I was not going to do it. And that still voice, that that discernments that keep going. And so I couldn't believe that they would take a business that was in the home, not a storefront, and actually come into my home in a beautiful way. Uh, something that I wasn't comfortable with at first, 30 camera people and you know producers coming in. But I said, you know what, Tamika, you have to take this leap. You have this opportunity, take the leap. And it was, again, a beautiful experience. Every single person on that team was so welcoming and loving to me. And then for me to even say, you know what, now it's time to go. And now I have my own office space. So something that made me a, a bit ashamed or uncomfortable ended up being something that, was, that changed my whole life. So it was, it was wonderful. Well, we got left on the cutting room floor and uh, didn't make the video, but um, we were um, used by um, Deluxe and, um, and helping a couple of the companies with their makeover and they bought furniture from us. Um, if you look at the video closely, you'll see some guys wearing some ideal commercial interior shirts. Uh, one of the companies that we work with that do painting, uh, we brought them in to uh, paint. Um, so we were uh, very pleased with the opportunity to work and, and actually buy products from us to be a part of. So they were um, doing their mission and helping us be a part. So I learned a lot, um, worked with Julie and uh, some of the other teams to, to really uh, enhance some of the uh, company's um, offices and um, we, um, we, we learned a lot in the process. I think that's one of the things that I found to be most um, beautiful about this process was the engagement of various um, businesses in different ways here was that that specialty of investing in growing, developing, transforming storefronts or um, a business models, advising, bringing in black owned businesses to do some of that using black owned um, uh, storefronts for the filming, et cetera, but then also um, engaging talent from corporations in some of that advising on business models. Can you all um, talk about how you expect this to impact your business? If you look out, whether that's 12 months from now or, or two to three years from now, what do you expect this um, uh, uh, experience to be like for your businesses, but also others who are featured um, uh, in this uh, series? Well, I think it always helps to shine the light on uh, companies and to let the broader community see what's going on. So many times we're caught in our own little silos. We don't see uh, people who are actually right next door who maybe we could participate and help with our dollars or our time or even just sharing information. I believe that um, we have to be more free and being able to help one another. And when we see a need or we see someone that uh, has something that we can. I grew up in a community in Texas where uh, there was only one pickup in the community and everybody used that pickup. And uh, so it wasn't like, you know, the only way we're gonna make it is to be able to support one another. And with the help we get from outside, we need to expand that by using our gifts and talents. Absolutely. Well, I can say that, um... So you saw on the show that I moved into my office space, my beauty bar, 
Well, uh, as of yesterday, I now have a storefront. And so I'm really excited to move Lipistein back into my neighborhood, which is the Rondo neighborhood um, in February. And it's just going to help benefit uh, the, the culture of that area. So I'm extremely excited. Good. Fantastic. Congratulations. We are cheering you on and running over there. <clears throat> Thank you. And I would like to say, since the show, we've um, Sammy's Avenue Eatery has seen a about a thirteen percent um, sales increase. Um, catering has um, been nonstop, which is great. Um, we've also gotten our new customer um, flow through has been up about twenty percent. So we um, are really um, we were really excited, and the show did benefit us in so many ways. Gave us the fresh just the fresh um, this upgrade that we needed. And um, the people, the people, which we are the people in our community, but to have people like Amanda and Julie and the deluxe team come in and, I mean, those guys were just really authentic. And we, I honestly didn't expect it. You know, I didn't expect them to, the, you know, them to be so authentic in their approach and what they were doing. So. I just really commend them and I really hope that some kind of way someone else can benefit from this experience as well. And I know we heard something about this being the last season of Small Business Revolution, which is super sad considering there's a whole country out there and that needs to have this same approach with their business. So um, I'm hoping that you know, and prayerful that God will come up with something to continue this process for someone else. And can I say too how important it was um, for the small business revolution to start filming at the time that they did because we were right in the midst of daily traumas. And so to have this group of people come in and all of us have probably worked with people that... Um, were sketchy, uh, something not right, or or they were um, obviously um, disgusted with black people. I'll just I'll just say that who made us uncomfortable in our own working spaces. So it was so important for them to come in and the people that are chosen to be on that team to come in the way that they did. Uh, they listened, and I cried many times about not being heard because I felt like in corporate areas, I wasn't heard or in family areas, I wasn't heard. So they listened, they did what we asked, they gave advice, but in a way that was authentic and genuine and kind. And that's what we need more of. Even if they didn't understand our community, they were open to learning. And so that's what we need to build America to be the place that we want it to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. That speaks a lot about the culture um, of the team that uh, Amanda and Deluxe have been able to build with Small Business Revolution. And I uh, appreciate um, you being able to lift that up and honor it. I want to bring um, uh, back now Amanda and Shauna into our conversation and then open up for some of our audience Q&A. Um, uh, thank you to the audience uh, for all of the chat that's been going on. It's been uh, phenomenal and I can tell they are loving all that you all have been sharing. Um, and they have lifted up some great questions for us in the chat. Feel free to keep dropping more. We'll get through as many of these as we can. Um, uh, Felicia Perry has been dropping some fire um, in the chat and in our Q&A. So I'm going to go here first um, with a question. This is what was the most helpful technical assistance or business advice you each received from the team? I would say our, uh, the best advice we got was to really um, invest in our catering side of our business. Um, we definitely uh, always catered, but we always did it word of mouth. Um, but to actually advertise for catering is something that we, I just hadn't gotten around to yet. And um, since we've done it, you know, it's been very, you know, kind of explosive people just didn't know we catered. So, um, and I was kind of shocked because we got so much catering before, but um, it's every day now. So it's like really um, 
really helped the business out a lot. Excellent. I think for, um, the best advice that I'll take forever is that, uh, and I said on the sh they said on the show, my voice is enough. Without without my voice, Lip Esteem can't be the business that it is growing into because it is the way it is because of me. And so as I scale, not just finding my voice, but being secure in what I'm saying, I know lipstick, I know cosmetics. Just if I like it, I like it. If I don't, it's okay to say you don't like something. So I Very love that. Powerful. Very powerful. Very powerful. Thank you both. Can you share, um, uh, can you think of which of these to go to, um, how watching the episode um, and particularly episodes that you were in might have changed how you view uh, your own business? That's interesting. That's an interesting. That is. <laughs> <laughs> that well, is a I, I think. I honestly think um, we. It it just um, like I said on the show. It's so hard to really talk about yourself and to tell your story because when you're doing what you're doing, you're just doing it. It's not a. I didn't come up with a, a you know, a skit or anything. It's just naturally we're doing what what is to be done what you see need to be done you're just doing it so it just really um um helped me to see that we do have a story and that we do have um input in our community and people are really receptive and really appreciative of what we add to the community so it just um kind of opened my eyes up to it because it's something that i don't look at every day as like what do you contribute to the community it's just you know you just naturally do what needs to be done if the dishes need washing you wash them you know so it's kind of that thing so it just opened my eyes to see oh we do um add a big part to our community and um we've been doing it for a while and um it's a great thing and the show helped me to see that i can really be an international brand and mm -hmm. that um and that the the story or the truth about me wanting to build communities, um, building white women and black women, Asian women, native women to be able to wear the same colors of lipsticks. Like that's not a small thought that is actually huge in repairing our communities. And so just to see that this can go way further than St. Paul, Minneapolis, um, is important for the country, one tube at a time. I absolutely love that. I absolutely love that. Were there reactions, Rick? I know you were in a different seat, but certainly also still got to see your employees engage in this. Were there any lessons or observations that you took about either your business or business as a whole from engaging in this process or seeing the show in the episodes? Um, I think, um, and you know, and seeing the show and episodes definitely, um, I being able to highlight and see the different models of business that are out there encourage uh, even some of my employees to know, um, and they have dreams and goals and things of that nature. How you can just with a small dream build something. So I think the highlighting of these businesses uh, did well for the community, and some of the feedback I got from some of my employees. Uh, because they have goals and aspirations of one day starting their own businesses. And I think to see everyday people like ourselves be able to go out and do business and uh, build businesses is encourage, encourages the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are there resources that you all learned about, either um, funding resources for minority-owned businesses, um, startup resources, um, other resources that you learned about that you think newer businesses who might be on the call or that others might know about need to know about and that you want to be sure that you share today? Well, I think the agency that I mentioned earlier, uh, and one of the things that I've learned is to really take advantage of what's out there and take your time, it's, it can be long and frustrating, 
but I think there are agencies out there that have like the meters, the NDCs and, and others who are working every day. And we have passionate people who love what they're doing and love to help. And I think taking their, um, taking the time to listen and to uh, gain a better understanding of how, of what's out there is definitely going to help build your business and not get frustrated and give up because it's not happening right away. So it's not going to happen overnight, uh, but it will happen if you um, are able to listen, not only to those helping, but to call other small businesses and see how they made it over as well. And also I learned um, to network through the, biz the small business revolution, which was something that I steered away from because I thought mm -hmm. it looked like a certain thing, right? And that thing I didn't want to do. But I've mm -hmm. learned that there's all different forms of networking. And because I've uh, embarked on new places and like Lunar Startup, NDC, both of them have helped me. But then NABO and other organizations, Women Venture, I go to these places now. So I meet new people who are looking for my business. So I think that's really important is that I learned through that is to network and get yourself out there. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You don't have to look like you in order for you to be in those spaces. Absolutely. Absolutely. Shauna and Amanda, are there resources that you all either might have come upon in the midst of this journey or that you know about now that you think it's important for both these business owners or others to know about through the journey? Yeah, I I would say that, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, the especially small businesses, they don't know about the grants that and, and funding that organizations have. Um, and it may not be something that's highly publicized, um, but if there's an organization that is in your community that you are serving, you know, um, go and talk to their employee resource groups, go and talk to, um, you know, their HR teams, their departments, they usually have some type of expendable budget that they can actually assist you if that's what you're looking for and or allowing them um, to offer up VTO hours, which is volunteer time off, their employees really want to help people in the community. Um, so whether that's helping you implement a platform or um, really investing in, you know, training you on some type of, you know, tools or services, look to those organizations because people want to help. They just don't know how. They don't know where to start. They don't know how. Um, so as I always said, closed mouth, don't get fed. Um, you know, I love what Tamika said about the networking thing. I think that's one of the things that her and I talked about um, to just get out there and, and, you know, put yourself out there, ask questions, you know, speak to people. People want to help. Absolutely. Well, if that's true, because I hear it, I just would love to see it. Mm -hmm. All this revolution, you all did it. Amanda, Julie, you all did it. You are putting your money where your mouth is, but your heart where your mouth is too. And so Lip Esteem, Sammy's, all of us are looking for help to mm -hmm. scale. I'm looking for help to build my new storefront. Like right. people that have these gifts and talents, I would love for um, people that have grants to let me know so that I can apply and, and move forward to help the community. That's important right now. Sorry, I'm shaking. I'm there shaking. you go, girl. I, I, mean, <laughs> I mean what I'm saying, I need, I need that. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. We wanna ask one last um, a question is, is really what you all take away from this. And while um, we have a question in there, it could be a, a funny one. If there was something that was a funny moment that you wanna let the audience in on that they didn't get to see on camera, if there's a heartwarming piece of this um, experience that you wanna let us in on, but really the thing that you'll take away is um, uh, the most, uh, I think, uh, lasting moment from this experience um, that you wanna be sure that um, uh, those folks who are attending this um, really leave with. Mine was how we're all connected in some way or another. 
um, being, you know, born and raised North Minneapolis um, and having children of my own. And Tamika actually has a connection to my daughter, um, which I had no clue about. Uh, which was something that was actually pretty interesting to to come home. And my daughter's like, how do you know Tamika? And I'm like, how do you know Tamika? <laughs> um, and just kind of, you know, reminiscing on, on the past and just knowing that there, especially in a community this small, there's always connections. I mean, mine, is, mine is in the same vein as what Shauna just shared. I, I shared earlier just how serendipitous this season was and how every conversation led to another one and to another one. And uh, so for each of the businesses this year, we uh, um, gave some dollars for them to pay it forward. All six of these businesses have the mission to, to give back. And so we just wanted to accelerate that in this moment of, of filming. And so uh, Tamika actually chose uh, the Black Women's Wealth Alliance. And Kenya was one of the first people we talked with in our community listening and had a great impact on shaping how the season came together. And we had no idea that like Tamika and Kenya had this connection. So when we're sitting down with Tamika and saying, who would you like to pay it forward to? When she said Black Women's Wealth Alliance, it was just like, it was just one more moment. And I could name over a dozen of these moments, just like Shauna did, where, where you would just find these connections. And it just gave me kind of a restored pride in the Twin Cities, but also just in just humanity and, and how we're all connected. And if we're all kind of living with this intention of just kindness and just paying it forward in every single moment and in every interaction, whether small or large moments, that those connections are, are of not just great value, but of great impact. And so I was just really moved by how this entire season, um, everyone's been saying really, really nice things about how it all came together. And we're, we're just so grateful that, that was the experience and that our intentions, um, came through, but it was just, it was so much bigger than just even the team that worked on it. It was just, it was just almost magical to just see how it all came together. And so we're all very blessed to be here in the Twin Cities and to be playing an active role in the way forward. So it was humbling and, and an honor to work with these businesses. And none of these businesses needed to be on the Small Business Revolution to be successful. I think that was also a big part of the mission behind the work. This, this, year was to show what happens when you invest in building black wealth that it isn't about this association of this wasn't charitable it, i think too much of the society we kind of associate sometimes black with just lack and it's not about that it's about how do you invest in businesses that are actually very very viable i mean look at sammy like sammy was doing great but what happens when you invest in a business to take it to that next level and i think that's what we need to see more of uh, is is how do you add you know kind of fuel to that fire not just you know. absolutely mm -hmm. you know the scene where I um, I want to say dunk the ball but I don't know basketball so how I made the <laughs> basket from behind I'll say it reminded me of this song I used to sing to my students I, I'm not gonna sing it. But the, uh, it was a Kanye West clip. It was like, I know I can be what I want to be. If I work hard at it, I'll be where I want to be. And that shot and everything that has happened is all because of believing in yourself and knowing that what you want can happen. Naysayers have to go. You have to focus on what you want and know that you can do anything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that shot was unbelievable on the first try. And yeah. And I was kicking and screaming the whole way, just to let you all know. I did not want to be the five foot three plus size woman that was sitting there trying to make baskets. I was not going to look silly on TV. So when he said, well, you can throw it like that. I said, well, that's how I bowl at Midway Pro Bowl. So I can, I can throw it. And then it went in. I said, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And Tamika, I have to tell you, you know, when you said you used to tell your students that my daughter said that you were her guiding light um, in her school when when you were one of her uh, teachers. So I appreciate you for that. Um, and we don't have enough 
obviously black representation in schools. Um, so thank you for always being who you are, just an amazing guiding light. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any final comments on impact, my friends? We're stronger together. Yes. Yeah, that's definitely. definitely. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Sure. Well, a big thank you to each one of you. A big thank you not only for joining us here today for Reckoning to Rise Together, not only for being a part of the small business revolution and bringing the stories of Black business in Minneapolis and St. Paul and the greater metro area to life on the screen, but for all that you do to invest in building Black wealth throughout our region and beyond. I am thankful that you were here for today and a big thank you to our audience as well for joining us for this conversation and for the work that you are doing in your communities to reckon, to rise together, to build black wealth by dismantling systemic racism inside our institutions, inside our communities and doing the work together in order to invest in our communities and build prosperity that is shared among our communities. We have been grateful for an entire year of reckoning to rise together. We launched this series after our summit last year and we have continued to move it forward. And you have been with us every step of the way as we saw in our reports and our polling at the beginning of today's session. And we want you to continue to be with us on this journey. I wanna remind you to take our survey because your feedback after today will help us inform how we continue this journey going into 2022. We will continue and come right back to you with a series and an event in January focused on the color of wealth and how we continue to address racial wealth gaps together. And we'll come back with our February series every Thursday in February, just as we did this year. We thank you for all the ways that you've partnered with the Center for Economic Inclusion. We want to say another big thank you to our partners, our sponsors, and our investors who help us do this great work. And to every one of our team members and staff here at the Center for Economic Inclusion who are so invested behind the scenes, not only in making these workshops happen, but in doing this work in solidarity with you out in the field in order to build communities that truly do work for everyone. Have a wonderful day, everyone.